The Minsky moment is defined as a sudden major collapse of asset values that marks the end of the growth phase in a market cycle. On its surface, it's a boring bland finance concept coined by Paul McCauley of PIMCO in 1998 to describe the Russian financial crisis. But before you click off this video and brush this off as a textbook econ lesson, the Minsky moment could very likely become the defining term of our generation. A notion that potentially describes the house of cards that is the modern American economy. In today's video, we break down if this is truly where we're headed and if this term accurately expresses our economy today. According to McCulley, a Minsky moment occurs after a long period of steady prosperity and gains, a stretch of time that distorts the perception of risk, which in turn promotes extreme leverage, pushing investors to use borrowed money instead of cash for what can only be described as sophisticated gambling. Look around and analyze the data and you will quickly realize that many of the features attributed to Minsky moments can be seen in our economy today. The first qualifying condition is incredibly easy to spot and verify. It's no secret that the stock market has enjoyed a 13 year long bull run with only two years in that stretch resulting in negative gains. Since 2009, the S&P 500 has gained over 500% with drawdowns occurring rarely and briefly. This time period of affluence and unlimited gains was made possible by the U.S. Federal Reserve, which enacted a policy of 0% interest and extreme quantitative easing in order to essentially cure this country of recessions and depressions. But just like alcohol numbs the pain, eventually when you snap back to reality, the hangover kicks in and pain and suffering overcome the body. The same concept applies to the economy. When the party stops is when the pain begins, and to many, there are plenty of signs that the music is slowing. The guests are leaving and closing time is approaching. Right now we have a Federal Reserve that is essentially out of ammo, unable to lower interest any further, and politically handicapped to print more money. Meanwhile, the CPI or inflation just hit a 40-year high of 7.5% and it's beginning to look like they are losing control. Jerome Powell is begging for a soft landing and the next few months will prove to be critical. Plenty of experts have come out and voiced their concerns on television programs like CNBC. Mohamed El Arian recently had some stunning comments in regards to Fed policy and why he thinks they may have lost the narrative with investors who believe the Fed is in panic mode. Take a listen. We're doing QE with inflation at 7.5%. Now, I don't know whether you think they will turn around at 3 p.m. Eastern later this afternoon and say, you know what, we're just going to stop QE now. Do you think they should? I don't, and I don't think they should do an inter-meeting um, hike, not because I don't think they are way behind on policy. They are so far behind, John, I don't remember a central bank being so far behind. You know, I, I warned that this was going to be one of the biggest policy errors. It certainly was one of the biggest inflation miscalls in the history of the Fed, and unfortunately, my nightmare is playing out. I wouldn't do a, a inter-meeting. Uh, I wouldn't... Um, not announce the balance sheet. I wouldn't stop QE suddenly. They should have done that much early. If they do it now, the market will sense blood. They will sense that the Fed is panicking. Um, the Fed has to do three things really quickly. It has to regain control of the inflation narrative. They have to be very straightforward, explain to us why they were so wrong and why we can now believe their inflation forecast. Two, they have to regain control of the policy um, narrative. They have to give us some sort of sense of what the soft landing looks like. And then three, importantly, they also have to show a lot more humility. A soft landing is the term El Arian uses as he attempts to essentially warn that Powell needs to tighten fast without spooking the markets, a task much easier said than done. The realization that a Minsky moment is on the horizon is now overtaking the investment landscape. We talked about how a long, sustained period of euphoric growth is one of the elements needed to enable such an event. But there is a second element that is required as well. Excessive borrowing. Investors participating in aggressive speculation typically take on additional credit risk during bull markets. This just means using borrowed money in order to make even more money. In other words, leverage. And while leverage can help you multiply your gains, should the market turn in the opposite direction, it can and will wipe you away. Following the Great Depression, there used to be harsh laws limiting the amount of borrowing one could do in order to buy and sell securities. Over time, through lobbying and other measures, big banks and institutions have implemented hundreds, possibly thousands of loopholes to get around these rules. 
Borrowing extreme amounts of money to buy stocks and derivatives has become the norm. Imagine for a second a bank gave you an unlimited loan. You could head over to your local casino, sit down at the roulette wheel, and max bet every spin. Doubling your wager for every loss, and soon you'll start to realize that the Martingale strategy works if you in theory have an unlimited amount of money. These banks do that with securities instead. They make big bets and when they lose, instead of getting margin called, they borrow billions upon billions of dollars, using it to buy up the asset, driving its price up, preventing losses. The strategy is a recipe for disaster as one day, black will come up 10 times in a row and the line of credit will dry up, leaving you with mind-boggling losses. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have warned everyone for years about this shameful practice on Wall Street. In 2020, they sat down for an exclusive interview and spoke in length about the dangers of leverage and how it dominates today's markets. But before I show you, take a moment to hit that like and subscribe button if you're enjoying the content. Now back to the video. The people who are making money out of this unreasonable extension of credit argue for it and nobody's speaking against it. Uh, and, and last time around, we got the correct regulation that came and stayed for a long time on margin debt, only because we had the worst depression in the history of the English-speaking world. That's what it took to get a little sense into the politicians. This time around, it just the total return swap. So what fixes it, though? I mean, there have been suggestions that there needs to be well, more transparency, the, there needs to be a, a, really a crackdown on allowing people to lever up like this. What, the what's correct the answer? answer was never to have allowed most of the stuff to start. But, but you allow the wrong kind of stuff to start, and it runs on you. It is tough to be, very, very, very tough to be a regulator. To really go after the big stuff, you're attacking the profit center of institution after institution after institution. The prime brokerage thing by its very nature means you're, le you're specializing in lending, lending to the big swingers. And of course it's dangerous. And the th rules they violated, the same guy was getting four or five brokers at once and of course he was buying stocks to keep them up to prevent margin calls. And once you start doing that, you're headed for an uh, ugly ending and of course it happened. But do you think that it would take a systemic breakdown before changes would actually get implemented again, like you referenced with the Great Depression? The last time it took the worst depression in the English-speaking world in all history. That's what it took to get the last correction. So going back to the Minsky moment, both variables are in place. As mentioned earlier, we have a long, sustained period of euphoric growth and a massive amount of speculation done with leveraged or borrowed money. The only question mark that remains is when the tipping moment will come. Timing market crashes is a near impossible job that relies more on luck than skill. We've seen many prominent investors like Michael Burry and Jeremy Grantham call on markets and claim that a crash was looming around the corner. They have been wrong for over a year now, and while the dangerous parameters they speak of are indeed flashing red, the stock market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. As always, thank you guys for watching. Please make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed it. We are now less than 3,000 subs away from the coveted 100k mark, so any help to get me there would be greatly appreciated.